Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the Dataversity webinar series, The Heart of Data Modeling, moderated by Karen Lopez. And this month's um, series is, or this month in the series, is sponsored by Embarcadero. Today, Karen will be discussing the best data modeler is a lazy data modeler. And just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag HeartData. You can also access the chat section in the top right corner of your screen to engage with Karen and each other throughout the session. As always, we will be sending a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce our speaker for today, Karen Lopez. Karen is a Senior Project Manager and Architect at Info Advisors. She has 20 plus years of experience in project and data management on large multi-project programs. Karen specializes in the practical application of data management principles. She is a frequent speaker, blogger, and panelist. Karen is known for her fun and sometimes snarky observations on data and data management. Mostly she just wants everyone to love their data. And with that, and you can also follow Karen on at at Data Chick on Twitter, if you don't already. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen to get us started. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thank you for that. Um, what can, how can people follow Dataversity on Twitter? At Dataversity, of course. Perfect, <laughs> perfect. And Dataversity.net, right? Yes. On on the intertube. Perfect. Um, well, I wanted to. Thank everyone for showing up. I hope you're having a beautiful summer or winter day, depending on where you are. I know we're having one here. Um, you know, coming up with topics for these things, this year we're trying to do things that are more about the core, the heart of data modeling. And I think for summer topics, it's good to have something that is full of snark, yet very useful. So I'm hoping we found the right sort of level of both of those today. And yes, I'd love for you to tweet and share today's event. Um, you can copy me at DataChick and use HeartData, which is our hashtag for this webinar series. Um, Shannon went to a great bio that I gave her about me. Um, but basically, I want you to love your data, and I want to confess that I'm very, very lazy. I'm a very lazy data modeler, and I want you to join me in being lazy. But I want to know how lazy you are. And now we always go through this as like a great test. So polling. I want to ask you if um, what sort of automation uh, features have you used in your own model tools? So macros, naming standards, templates. Um, but mostly automation, scripts that you've written, any of those things. I want to hear about it. So have you used them? Um, have you used them and given up? You used a lot of them, and you have a whole development team and projects and projects managers dedicated to your doing that. So you've got about 30 seconds or so to tell us, or five seconds, 20 seconds to tell us um, how lazy you are as a modeler. Last chance for your votes. Mm, I can kind of see the initial returns, so that's kind of interesting. So what I'm seeing on my screen, because I don't get to see what you're seeing, is that um, a few of you, 28 of 135 here, said, no, you're not using any. Uh, 13 of you said you tried and gave up. 41 says we use them a lot. And one of you said you have a whole development team dedicated to that, and I think we're all very jealous. 52 of you were so lazy you didn't even vote on the poll. I want to give you a gold star for that. So now the next poll question is, have you shared any of the scripts, macros, naming templates, doodads, 
that you have developed for your data model? Um, and so, yes, you have. Nope, you're not allowed to. Don't know where to share them. Or no, not at all. And we're going to talk about this whole sharing of scripts and models. I should have added another poll that asked, would you like to use other people's scripts and have them? That would have been a good one. And then I could have done the analysis of people aren't sharing them, but they all want others to share. Oh. So you get about 20 seconds to jump in. And it looks like, to wait for it to finish. And it looks like 34 of you have shared them before outside your organization. Uh, 12, uh, you aren't allowed to. 11, about the same number, don't know where to share them. Um, 40 of you haven't shared them at all, just don't share them. And almost 60 of you just had no answer. Again, a gold star. So some of the comments that people are saying is um, you haven't given up, but you don't use them often enough, and you share them internally on only, or that you've used other people's macros. I use other people's macros all the time. So that's good. So it turns out that a lot of you are lazy. That's good. Um, especially given how we're using that today. Um, but not enough of you are lazy, so my goal for today is to make all of you be lazy data modelers as well as to share your laziness throughout. Um, we talked about this. So I want to talk a little bit uh, why I want, why I'm a lazy data modeler and what the heck do I mean by lazy. I'm going to attempt to do some demos and screenshots and whatnots of some of the automation features in some tools. Um, of course, we only have one hour for this whole thing, so this isn't going to be a how-to. I'm going to show you some demos of the macros that I've developed and why, I, and I'm going to explain sort of the reason I had to do a macro and not use some other feature or not sit through and slog through an 800 entity data model and do all this stuff manually um, and give you some backstory about it. And then, of course, 10 tips for being more lazy. But why this topic? So I started out, and if you're experienced like I am, you know that data modeling tools, um, you know, for the longest time, uh, we couldn't even, and even still in some tools, you can't just say, okay, I've got this beautiful data model with my 100 subject areas. Now just go print all the nice, beautiful diagrams from my tool, all of them, all at once. Just send that job to the printer. I'll go wander over and stick another couple of reams of paper in the printer, but just go do that. No, the way you have to do it in a lot of tools is open each subject area or submodel go to the file and print and then set all your settings and then print it, hope that you have enough video memory on your really small under, under um, spec work machine and hope for the best. Well, I was a lazy person and I decided my first foray into writing macros was figuring out a way to automate that so that I didn't have to do it. And I'd love for you to share in the chat um, some ex um, examples of ways and, and ways that you thought of of being lazy, either out of frustration or because you got tired of messing up doing 100 of the same change over and over again. So you can quote me on this, the title to this webinar, The Best Data Modeler is a Lazy Data Modeler. And in today's session, this sort of came about, it's a saying I've been using for a while, but it also came about from a blog post on my website called the best data modeler is a lazy data modeler. And you can go read up on uh, a little bit of a rant that I have there on why people should be more lazy. But most of the content in that post has made it into this webinar. So this is what most people think when I say I'm a lazy data modeler and why I want to be one. And these are just exam examples of things I do in my life when I'm not preparing data models. They're things I do while I'm not 
cutting and pasting sheets of paper and taping them all together to make one giant printout. What I'm doing while I'm uh, not uh, going through and adding a create date, modified date, modified user to the end of all 800 tables in my data model. Uh, what I do in, let's just say, the life outside of modeling. Now, not all of this is fun. Some of it is, um, by being lazy, that gives me time to blog, to do presentations, to do these webinars, to speak, to be an advocate for good causes, to attend EDW, to do lots of space things, to eat and enjoy beverages, and to do some advocacy stuff that I do, especially with Barbies and Legos. But it's not just about having free time just to be lazy. It's about focusing the activities that I do as a data modeler to make better data models. So in a lot of my webinars, I've mentioned that I think most data modeling is more about forensics than creating things. I'm trying to uh, be like Quincy MD. I'm talking to users, trying to get to the truth. I'm investigating data. I'm looking at source systems. I'm mapping source systems to target systems. Those are the hard things. Those are the activities that the human brain excels at and computers are really lousy at. I want to provide better service to my customers. I want to build better quality data models, data models that are more accurate, that reflect the requirements as we need them today, as well as our near-term requirements. I want to build flexible data models. I want to build data models that perform well. I want to have time to learn about my target DBMSs, so I want better databases. I want to provide better support to my teams. I don't want to be an obstacle to them, and I want to give them all the pieces of the data model, and I want to tailor it to their needs. Not just generate one report or one diagram of the model, but tailored diagrams and reports, one for the DBAs, one for the devs, um, printouts for the users that are different than for the DBAs, but I can't do all that manually. And the key thing is, is I want to spend my time doing tasks that require my mind and not just a bunch of mouse clicks. So that's my goal for that. So a lazy data modeler is a better data modeler, but that doesn't mean we're doing this to avoid work. It means that I want to spend my time on more important tasks and tasks that have a greater impact. But when I talk to a lot of modelers, either in sessions or on my projects, one of the things I've heard is that modelers aren't using a lot of the automation techniques. So the first one I hear is, there's such a huge learning curve, I don't have time to learn it. And we're going to talk about that one in a minute. The second one is, I'm not a programmer. Well, I'm not a programmer either. I think I was a programmer for a good 18 months at the start of my career, and I knew I didn't want to do that. A lot of people don't know that there are automation features that they can use and automate away a lot of their junk data modeling time. And by junk data modeling time, I mean that time of literally the examples I gave, adding the same attributes to every entity, responding to a bulk change request, like to rename customer to client, to um, what else, to change all of our varchar data types to in varchar data types. All of those things, those tasks are something that a computer can do not only faster, but close to perfectly, whereas humans, it will take a long time and it will be error prone and we will miss out on things. The other issue that I really want to put a lot of weight on today is that no one shares their scripts or their macros or whatever it is that we're talking about for automation. And this is, as the years progress, this has become more and more of a problem. And I work with a lot of other communities, DBAs, devs, even business analysts, that share their content, like their non-proprietary content like crazy. Uh, and I think there's a lot of myths going around in the data modeling community or sort of people stuck in a mindset of, you know, that we haven't got into this sort of mindset of open source and sharing and common licensing um, to make 
everyone's jobs easier, which means lazier. So people don't know they, they can automate things because maybe automation came in your tool sets, and even though our tools have been around for 20-some years, the automation features are either fairly recent or they keep changing and being upgraded or they're hidden away someplace else or they only work outside the tool. So maybe they've, people have never even clicked on that feature or gone there, or they went there and they saw a bunch of code and some very oddly named list of things and were perplexed. They had no idea, idea what to do when they clicked on something. Or they ran a script because a sample script came with the tool. It broke their model and they never want to come back to working with the automation. Or they tried to do it, it was a huge time suck, so they gave up. These. This is common to anything that's new. And if we talk to accidental data modelers who were told they needed to do a data model and were handed over Erwin or ER Studio or Power Designer or one of those tools and told, go do a model, they'd experience this exact same thing. You know, maybe they've done a data model before by reverse engineering a database and they got a nice diagram and they, they think of data models as diagrams, but we know they're not diagrams. We know that it's a whole application and that the diagrams are mostly just a printout or just a view of the data model or a way of interacting with the data model. So these exact statements that we data modelers say about automating our data modeling are the same ones that people who automate things say about our data modeling tools. And yet we look at them and say, what do you mean it was too hard? This stuff's easy. You just drag this, you click on this, you do this. This is where the two sets of skill sets can come together and work together to make each other's lives better. So yes, there's a learning curve, but one of the great things is most of the tools come with samples and we can access shared scripts if we're sharing them. You can build the equivalent of a Hello World script um, that's very easy to do, and once you do that, you just start expanding on it. Um, I think you could spend 20 minutes a day or a, a week learning a bit more, or you could spend 20 minutes a day or a week making a business case to get a developer or scripter to help you with these things. You could get some training, or you could join an online community or forum to, to help you work you through how these scripts work. So here's some of the community resources you have. So Embarcadero, thank you Embarcadero for sponsoring this webinar. Um, They've just created a new community site on, on their website. So the old one, which was called EDN, is now being transitioned over to community.embarcadero.com. And there are forums where you can go ask questions, um, where you can ask specifically, I'm looking for a script to do this. Has anyone done this before? Um, or which of the sample scripts, and there's a lot of sample scripts that come with ER Studio, which ones would they, they work? Erwin also has online communities at erwin.com and the same sort of thing. And a lot of the people posting here are people that we've all known in the Erwin community for a long time. Um, uh, Erwin was one of the first communities to have online communities. I used to host these online communities for all of these tools and that sort of died off as the vendors took up the slack and provided their own communities. But there, you can get macros or macro support here. SAP, which owns Power Designer, also has a community for Power Designer. Um, so this is part of their formal SAP uh, community network where you can go ask questions and get help. But they also have a community in a news group, which you can access through some Google properties. This has probably been around the longest and probably where you could find some great automation tips for Power Designer. So one of the feedback I got from a couple of my webinars has been that I'm not pausing to take questions, and it's a lot harder since we're not doing panels anymore. I used to be able to multitask that. So I'm not um, – <laughs> if you need to catch up on the coffee and the mosquito repellent, we'll do that in the after show. So. Um, there is a question about how does Erwin handle automation like this? I'm going to show you some examples of those things in a minute. Um, some people, uh, awk is a powerful programming language for text processing. Yep, there's all kinds of things you can do with the output of a data modeling tool. 
Um, also a great tip from uh, Jason says from a Unix professor, if you're going to do something more than once, write a script. If you think you only have to do it once, write a script. Yes, I've heard that one before. That's awesome. Um, uh, also some comments about some tools are very difficult and others make it easy. Um, you know, the funny thing is, is that depending on your skill set, one person's easy is another person's awkward. So I'm definitely going to uh, address that as I show some of the examples. Uh, any forms or script samples for InfoSphere Data Architect? I'm sure there are. I didn't look into that, um, but uh, I'll try to follow up with that afterwards. And so while I was looking at your questions in the chat, if you actually have questions for me, try to put them in the Q&A section, because depending on how much chat you guys get going, I might not see all the questions. So the other objection that people have is, I'm not a programmer. And I say, great, not a problem, because some tools require um, or pretty much demand that you have real application development skills, tool sets, that you understand what multiple inheritance and threading and uh, object isolation and all these things are. Um, some tools just require scripting level skills. Uh, you can use some tools to record keystrokes and then generate a script. So in ER Studio, which I'll be showing you some of my macros, some of the functions that I put into this script, I did by using a Microsoft Office feature that allows you to record your steps as you do something in Excel, like enter text into a cell and then color it and then maybe underline it and center it. You can record a script in the Microsoft scripting language, which is Visual Basic based, of course, VBA based. And then that will give you kind of the general syntax for the office objects and the office automation that then you can incorporate into your tools macros. And you might have to slightly change the syntax, but generally, the syntax in Office that you might use in your data modeling tool is going to be either exactly the same or very similar. All the tools come with sample macros and scripts. Um, and some of the sample macros and scripts, and we'll look at it, just kind of do some really scary, silly things. But I think they're there to expose you to the concepts of selecting a model, opening a model, um, choosing things selecting things and only doing actions on the objects that are selected and iterating through you know, all, the, all the diagrams and then all the tables and then all the attributes and then all the relationships. Those kind of provide a framework for how you can automate some of your lazy tasks. And then some tool vendors provide places for organizations and people to share their macros and scripts. And all of these together can help solve this, but I'm not a programmer because I'm not a programmer either. No one shares their scripts. I talked about that. This community has a long and infamous and sad history of not sharing scripts. And I'm here to script shame you all for not doing that. Uh, I've tried many times in my online communities to set up macro exchange points. I know Embarcadero has. I know CA has. Um, I'm pretty sure that SAP does. Um, we build these places, but no one comes and shares their scripts. Um, the way the rest of the world does it is through online collaboration things like GitHub or even private scripting areas within your organization, whether it's SharePoint or JIRA or some our team foundation server, places where you put all your scripts together and share them. So I understand that um, there are legal issues and that people are concerned about sharing their work. Certainly, um, you wouldn't want to be mailing your data model around outside your company if that was considered proprietary information. But there's kind of this, um, it's well recognized in other parts of the IT community that non-proprietary scripts that do things in a very generic way, like backup and restore a database, that's not proprietary. And there's really only about, there's probably less than a dozen ways that one could do that. In fact, there's even some IP law that says that these scripts aren't even works of art because they're not complex enough and they're not a creative work of art. 
they're just scripts. And I think that um, these legal obstacles that I keep hearing about, of course, if your boss says you can't share them, then you can't share them. But I think people are assuming that everything that they do at work can't be shared. And yet I see all these other communities have been doing this for decades, and not just open source companies, but sharing scripts widely. They blog about them. They um, they release them in a Creative Commons license that allows other people to improve them. And we're going to talk about this incremental approach in a minute. I think this is where we need to be. It's time for data modelers to join this century. And I would so love if like 100 people would go tweet that right now. It's time for us to join this century. So what kinds of lazy does Karen think you could do? Well, I think of scripting and automation really in two different buckets. There are probably more of these. There's internal model CRUD, so things we do inside a model to create, update, and delete objects and properties. So naming standards was the original uh, automation of being able to automatically generate, say, physical names based on the logical names for creating new columns, such as what people call the audit columns, the create date, the modified date, the last updated by, um, reason codes, adding IDs to everything, that can be highly automated. And then there's some more I'm going to show you in a bit for applying indexes and constraints. And just, you know, there's hundreds of different thing, types of things inside your model, if not thousands, and most of these automation interfaces allow you to do them that way. Um, but then there's external to your model productivity. So things that you can do, like I said, generating a diagram, a, a image file of every subject area, printing them all, generating custom reports, um, making backups of your model, um, managing all the supporting files, like a naming standards template, or a forward engineering template, or configurations, or standard data models, or templates that you use. And the more you can automate about these things, the more likely they'll be consistent either across your models or across your modelers and your workstations. So there's some uh, automated naming standards um, that people can do. And uh, most of these have examples that I call metadata stuffing. Um, and I blogged about this once. Let your computer apply your crazy metadata stuffing scheme. So by metadata stuffing, I mean if your shop says that every table has to be prefixed with TBL underscore and that um, the first two characters of every table name have to be an abbreviation for the subject area for which it is belongs to, and then even in this blog post I talk about a real life example where we had to have a three letter uh, ID of the DBA who was responsible for doing all the work on that table. And I'll let that sink in for a minute. That's metadata stuffing, so I'm not a fan of these naming schemes, but we do have naming schemes that we like to apply, like um, naming every view with view or V in front of it, or all dimensions this way and all facts that, that way. You want to automate this because, again, it's something that takes a lot of time and needs to be explicitly 100% accurate, so things that humans are terrible at and that computers are great at. But you might have to deal with physical constraints of your DBMS, so the common one, Oracle and DB2, only allowing 30-some characters in a name, but your logical names, you know, you've made them free and easy and open and long so that you get names like retail transaction line item modifier event, and now you have to wedge that into 32 characters, or worse, even 18 or 3. You can apply these constraints either with the native in features of your tool, so lots of tools allow you to do that, or through um, some other type of script that would allow you to you know, change all spaces to underscores, or remove all spaces, or change any special characters to spaces or underscores. So there's all kinds of things you can do with automation, and all kinds of tools have these features that are built in, and they're fairly seminal, not quite the, exactly the same in how they do it, but sometimes the naming tools aren't enough, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. So let's look at some tools. So CA Irwin Data Modeler, it has a full-blown API 
uh, object model where you can build a completely separate client to do automation against your internal tools and the external type chain. They have active scripting. It's based on Visual Basic, so VBA, Visual Basic for Applications. Um, and it's documented online. Um, if you search for Irwin API Reference Guide, um, I don't go to support.ca. I have a hard time finding things for the right version of the tool. So I just search for API Reference Guide uh, version 9 or 9.6 or whatever version of the tool that you're working with. And I find that an easier way to find this resource. There's also an IrwinKnowledgeBase.com, and in this place they have this Irwin I API tutorial spreadsheet. Um, and I think I can show that to you. Yes. So that basically is a spreadsheet, but it's not just a spreadsheet. And I um, have these clickable things disabled right now um, because I can show you how behind those clickable things are um, – no, I don't know how to change the uh, – I should know how to change this. So that you can see some of what happens here. Basically, there's code embedded into that spreadsheet that goes and does any of the things that are clickable on there. Sorry. Um, this is code that has been distributed as sample code, and like I said, it's embedded into this spreadsheet that does things like delete objects from your model, harden data types, find certain physical names, rename some attributes. Now, this is not how I'd think of automating my model. Um, but certainly you can think about how you could embed some automation features into a report that you distributed, for instance, something like having a user go through the objects and potentially being allowed to update um, definition names or uh, definitions or something like that. So this is intended as a sample resource for automating in Erwin. So that's one resource for you. So what happens in SAP? So SAP, or sorry, in Power Designer, they have ability to automate things using whatever languages you have, Java, VBScript, C, other languages. It can be ex executed inside the tool, um, but because these are text files just like the other one, just like in Erwin, they can be edited and managed outside the tool. And you can go to infocenter.sybase.com and search on Power Designer, Macros, and Automation. So some examples from their documentation is, and you're going to see something that looks a lot like this. Um, so this is something that is getting the current model um, and getting uh, the objects in it, and it's going to go do something throughout. So it's going to scan a package and do these things and it's a Visual Basic script. So Embarcadero has a macro language inside the tool based on SACS basics that, basic that is very similar to VBScript. So when I brought up before that some people find it something very difficult to work with is so I'm old and experienced, and one of the very first programming languages I ever learned was basic. So when I go to use VBScript or SACS basic, I, that's how I think about automation. It's how I think about um, working with code. See, I told you I'm old and experienced. But that's very easy for me. But for people who are used to working in less procedural language, less scripty-like languages, it's actually harder for them to work in there. And they're going to be naturally drawn to a more object-oriented. Um, so. Someone's saying in the link it doesn't appear to be live anymore. So I just captured that today. Maybe if you search for – so that's probably what ended up 
in my URL that was much longer. So if you just search for uh, Power Designer Macro and Automation, you'll find the documentation for Power Designer. I believe they're at version 16 or something. So I'll try to update that link, get you the proper link when, before we distribute the slides. Sorry about that. Um, but with Embarcadero, so the, the macro language is there, the documentation is inside the ER Studio tool. That doesn't mean there, are, there aren't resources probably outside of it, but the documentation is there. So let me see if anyone else has any questions before I go. Nope, doesn't look like it. So I'm going to pop over to, well, let's start with ER Studio. So what I have in ER Studio is a data model. So this is an AdventureWorks data model. Uh, you don't need to read the model right here. I have my usual objects all on the left-hand side. But the macro and automation features are down here. And um, basically, they are, I have macros that I have written. Almost all of these have been derived from the sample ones that come when you install the tool. You just have to go find them and download them. But I'll show you one, or I'll show you sort of the interface. So you can have, um, you have this area where it's going to show me things. You can have multiple tabs open. And the macro language is right in here. You can edit it in here. I tend to use another editor. Um, but this one's pretty good. So I defi define a bunch of variables, and I, um, it iterates through, it gets me the active diagram, and then I get the active model. So the model I have open, and then um, it figures out whether I've got a logical or physical one. And then I have to fill in where I want these images. So what this macro does is it generates a PNG file, which is like a JPEG image of every data model, and it names it according to the diagram, which is kind of like the subject area, uh, or the, it, and the submodel name, the subject area name. Now, one of the issues that I, try, I needed to solve as I built this iteratively. So the first time I built this, I just had it go generate a PNG, and it was just named like one, two, three, four, five of all the things. And I thought, well, that's not a good thing. I want to put a proper name to the image file so that when I put these out on a SharePoint, or a, file, a shared file server that I know what it is without having to open it up. And then I found out, well, we have these beautiful background colors, and that makes it harder to print and harder to read. So I don't want to do that, especially if people were sending it to a black and white printer. So it goes through, and I can set the various properties that I would normally have to set up in a wizard of what the image quality was, what type it was, what size it was going to be and everything. So if I go through, and in most of these tools, when you automate, the undo isn't going to be available to you. So that's definitely true. So what's happening is, this used to be something that would literally take me an hour in uh, a data model that had, you know, 100 submodels to go do this. But now what I've done is created something that I had a custom name. So Kitty Demo Adventure Works is the name of my model, and log means logical, not physical, and then it's got the name of the submodel or subject area, and it pulls its version number from the version property on there. And then I can go see, hold on, let me go find this. Where did I put them? Oh, Embarcadero, right? So imagine this was a shared drive, and what you were doing was every day printing out an image where anyone who wanted to see your data models could go do self-service 
to go get an image because this used to be a real interruption time suck for me is people would come in as, could I get a printout of the employee data model? And I'd want to do that for them. Now, of course, we have portals. We have um, ways of generating reports that have these in here. But this, was, this is to supplement and complement that, where people just want to go and have a printout. Maybe they've marked up their own. They don't need to have to go log in. They can just go find something. Now, the other thing I can do, as I'm going to talk about later at the end, is I can have this macro run as a job and just run every morning or every night and print out the working copies of my data models, of the ones I'd like to share. And those are all there now, and I didn't have to spend hours doing it. So there's other... Um, I can go find columns and tables that have spaces in their name. And the reason I needed that for one project is, yes, I can use a naming standard for that. Um, but this was solving a specific problem of people who were creating new things, other modelers who had a different naming standard because they had a different target DBMS. And it kept we kept ending up with names that didn't match our standard, and our standard was camel case or initial cap case. And I could quickly just search for problem things. And this was a problem for us. Um, we also had some DB2 specific issues about generated expressions, which are calculated fields where we had to use all fields that had a certain suffix on them. We wanted to automatically generate a really complex calculation for them, a calculated field, an expression. So it was. Um, removing some special characters, but not all special characters, what we considered special characters, and also turning them to all uppercase. And that's what the uppercase thing did. Um, one of the more complex things we had to do was automatically create indexes for certain types of attributes such as foreign keys or primary keys. Now, in a lot of tools, that's something that you can have automatically done at creation. But if you reverse engineered a model or if you've compared in something, it doesn't necessarily mean that those things get created. But you can't just run a splat type script that just recreates them because what do you do if there's multiple foreign keys on a table you don't want them all renumbered and renamed all the time because they ended up being in a different order in the object model of your data model. So it needed to be a little bit more complex than a naming standard template or a naming standard utility. And what we've done is it goes through our entire model and goes through all of the columns, and for foreign key columns, it creates an index using not just our naming standard, but to preserve the names that are already there in case there are duplicates. So if there's already a name, we don't want to touch it. But if there's more than one, we want it to increment. So you can see we have one where we, a table, where we have at least seven of these things. So we don't want to, um, go back and rename all the indexes. That's something you just can't do with an automatic naming feature. So the other things that I like, and this is highly borrowed from existing macros um, that were done at Embarcadero years and years ago, um, is exporting some metadata into Oh, my Excel is stopped. There we go. Now, what this is doing is it's pulling just the stuff I want to report out of my model in the format I want it. And I can choose the colors I want. And yes, there's some native features. I can export metadata out of a model um, using some reporting features or export to CSV. Um, but then every time I wanted to publish this to something, then I would have to bring in that CSV data, format it according to the way. Um, but now with a macro, I can do things like add the project or the company logo, the times, um, pull the things that I really think are relevant and not just all of them. I can choose how they're described. You know, it, there are things that I can do to just customize this view in a way 
that maybe the modeling tool vendors don't want to express it, but maybe we have unique ways by calling something mandatory or optional versus um, null or not null or required or not required. Um, I've also used this on one project to produce reports so that the some of the characteristics were done in another language. So instead of saying mandatory or optional, I was able to say in the language what they were. Now, one of the things about using macros that work this way in most tools is that um, this is very fragile. Like if I started working on this Excel spreadsheet, it would just start printing where I'd put the cursor. Like some of these macros are things that you have to set it and literally take a break, like go have coffee or go work on something else. Um, so this isn't you know, quite the same thing as a native feature, but the trade-off of getting exactly what you want out of it can be really good. Now, one of the reasons why a lot of us have started automating some of these Excel reports is that while most tools have beautiful reports that you can extract out, they're kind of known for having a lot of white space and a lot of pages. Being able to customize things allows me to compact the data and also to just do exactly what I want in the format and the content that I want. So I think I can stop this now. But you can see, well, this is very similar to the sample macros that came out. I was able to customize it the way I wanted it. So here's a really short example of I just want to quickly, now have I interrupted it? I did. Oh, this is a selection one, sorry. I'm not even paying attention to my own documentation. This allows you to pick some entities. and selectively produce just their table, like this particular macro prints, the tables I've selected and their definitions. Very quickly, something I wanted to do, and I didn't have to go through a report generation thing and exclude a bunch of stuff, and it didn't take me 15 pages to print it out. So I'm saving trees as well as mosquitoes. But my goal here wasn't to you know, show you about these specific macros, but to talk about problems that I had that were taking a lot of my time, that were impacting my ability to service my end clients, and my end clients were both users and project managers and business analysts and DBAs and devs by developing these macros. And I've improved on some of these macros over time to get it to do what I want to do. You notice my macros aren't that complex. Like, there are some over here in the Samprint macros that have a full-blown interface where you can choose which files you want and what drive you want it to be on, um, how you want to name things. And if I had more time, I'd add more of those features. One of the key things about working with automation is to just think of it as something you're going to build in incrementally. You're going to leverage other people's work if they'll share it with you and constantly make it better. If I had sat down and decided I needed to develop all these macros and do it all at once and make them perfect at once, I'd probably still be sitting here months later, which would keep me from doing it at all. Um, so that was ER Studio. In Irwin, they, I told you they have this API interface. I showed you the sample uh, that they have with Excel. But just like in most tools, the number one way we get exposed to automation is through just sort of functions and functionality. So for instance, you know, I can look at how I want to physically name a table based on its entity name. But if I wanted to expand on it, I could do that. And I could say, you know, I want to add the words kitty table at the end because I'm metadata stuffing. I want everyone to know that kitty, that Karen, worked on the store table. Um, that's a crazy one. But maybe I want 
um, heaven forbid, if you work in the shop that requires you to have the table name prefixed to every column name. You don't want to do that manually. You want to do that in an automated fashion. So that's where these physical naming structures as well as sort of the naming standard templates come into play. Um, sorry. And also hardening of them. So the other thing to think about is as you run these macros and especially use these naming functions inside of tools, is sometimes when you set a physical name, no matter what happens after, you don't want it to be reset, especially after you've already gone into production. So you can do something called hardening in most tools um, where you say, even though I created this dynamically named object, at some point I want to break that link so that if I change my naming standard or if um, you know we just decide now we're going to allow a few more characters, you definitely don't want to go change all these physical names. You usually won't want to go change all these physical names because the development and the migration cost of doing that will be significant and you will not be loved and valued. So those were some examples of, of some automation. I wish we had more time to cover on it more. Um, but why I want you to be lazy is to take mindless tasks tasks, anything that computers are great at and humans are bad at and that take a lot of time and automate them. Because you were hired for your brain, not for your good looks. You need to be spending your time on tasks that involve thinking and analysis and deciding, not just click here, click here, click here, click here, change this, go add these hundred objects. Um, this will give you more time for modeling and not for printing and reporting. And I'll give you more time to help be a good friend and a good advocate for your developers and DBAs. And we all want that. Now, I wish I could also spend another hour talking about PowerShell. So PowerShell, very quickly, is a feature that comes with Windows now, I think starting in Windows 7, definitely in Windows 8. It's a Windows feature that allows you to automate almost anything. So I have PowerShell scripts that I use for creating virtual machines and configuring and installing software and restoring databases, sample databases into them um, for, and I use these for my test databases. I use them for training as well. Um, and I've again built, the, I and other people that I work with uh, have built these scripts to automate both virtual machines and things we do on Windows both locally and on-premises, as well as work I do in the cloud in Microsoft Azure. And it allows me to go do a whole bunch of things consistently very quickly. So I can fire up a virtual machine in the cloud, I can in install, I can have it have SQL Server on it because that's what I work with, and perhaps install ER Studio and get the license key all set up. and um, do a restore of some test databases I use, I can do my testing, and then I have another script that goes through and shuts down all my virtual machines. And just do that. And, you know, setting up a VM takes a few minutes to an hour, and I'd rather spend that hour not doing that and not patiently waiting for wizards to go and things to click. Let the computers do the work that they're good at. Um, but just about anything in Windows, uh, in Windows or Azure that you can do, PowerShell can do. And that we joke in some of the communities that I work in that PowerShell is a cult because people start using it for things that go beyond what it was used for. But to using, I could use PowerShell to run a job and a Windows uh, agent or a SQL Server agent to, you know, I can have all these options of tasks, of scheduled tasks that I can create for instance, I could create a scheduled tax, task to go fire up ER Studio and run these three macros every morning, even if ER Studio wasn't running. I can't do that inside ER Studio. I can do it because I have a combination of Windows automation, so OS automation, together with my modeling tool automation, and I can make those all work together. So I have these rules for being lazy. Don't spend your time doing things that a computer is faster and better at. Automation's your friend. Don't try to do it all at once. 
don't get crazy. Don't be part of the cult where you're trying to do everything the modeling tool does in a script. So, for instance, I've seen people, you know, hand generate all the DDL using the scripting language when they could just use the features of their tool. But I, ha I do have some macros that if we had had time I could show you that generated a series of permission grants based on um, some unique rules that we had. I just generated all of those to a text file, so technically it was DDL, but it wasn't my tables and structures, it was just a bunch of permissions that I wanted to use to grant permissions for like QA users, test users, and developers, and some read-only grants so that every time we get, went to build a database, we had those. And yes, I probably could have done that in a SQL Server tool. I could have done it based on a spreadsheet. But I was able to quickly iterate through all my tables and, and all of my users in my model and generate those scripts just the way I wanted them to be. I want you to focus on mindful things, not mindless ones. Don't be doing junk data modeling tasks. And then finally, a really important thing. If you've automated it, you must ask your vendors to make this a feature of their tool. So I'm still perplexed why it takes so long to print an image or uh, 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 open up every subject model and do something to it. I think those are some of this automation ought to be built into our tools. So let's summarize a bit. Automating boring tasks are going to make you happier, and happier data architects are better data architects. Automating all these mindless things is going to make your boss happier. Um, automating tasks makes for much more accurate work. If you have to do something 100 times over and over again, I'm going to guarantee to you you're not going to do the same thing. Uh, saving time for your, you and your team members is going to make everyone happier, and a happier data modeler is a happy data model. So your tips, learn these automation features, use them in your tools, learn some PowerShell. There's a lot of resources I'm going to show you in a minute. Never run a script on your production models without testing and understanding it completely. So people open these sample scripts that come with their tools that do crazy things like add a whole bunch of attributes to the person table, or drop every table that's selected, delete them, or delete all your relationships. You know, some of the scripts there are nifty little scripts that you shouldn't just run. And the problem with the scripts are, like I said, is a lot of them you can't undo what's been done. Uh, a lot of them might cause layout problems with your models, even if you could undo them. Um, you need to read through the script, understand what it does, even if it came from the vendor, because those are samples. They're there for you to learn. They're not there explicitly for you to just run willy-nilly to see what it does. You should ask for developer support if you need that for your tools, just like anything else. Your models are production data for you, so they deserve professional skills. You should look at all the activities you do every day, all day, and question whether they need to be done. And if they're mindless, boring, repeating tasks, you should try to automate them. Um, you should free up junk modeling. You should just put that in your status report that you freed up some junk modeling to do mindful things. And think in terms of being iterative and building a little bit more, not trying to build a complete automated data modeler system. And I think you should be lazy all the time, every day, and get more lazy every day. So some resources that are in the slide. I also wrote about and gave a presentation called The Best DBA is a Lazy DBA, um, which is also has some of these features not quite the same. The place you want to go for PowerShell help is right here in this script center. There's videos, tutorials, blogs, funny videos, and songs. And GitHub, which is where I'm going to start putting my scripts that I'm going to share under a shareable license. Um, and I hope that you will join me there and also post them to your communities. So find three tasks right now that are junk modeling and start thinking how you could automate them. You're going to go search for some macros. You're going to make it your own and use it. So that's as much as I have for the presentation. I'm going to check here for questions. And um, 
I asked for spell checking definitions back when it was logic works and it only took them 20 years to add it. Yeah. So a lot of, in a lot of dev tools that I use, I end up having to generate some report into Word and do the spell checking there. And then it's really difficult because if you have initial case objects, it makes it hard, but you could just generate the definitions and do spelling and grammar checks that way. And you like my space shuttle shipper, slippers, so do I, and I'm wearing them right now, actually. Um, they're kind of what I do when I'm lazy. So are there any other questions out there? I don't see any coming in. Um, what that means is that um, it's probably near time to end the recording, but Shannon, do you have anything to add? It is Just want to thank Embarcadero again for sponsoring today's yep. webinar. Absolutely. And as always, this is fantastic, Karen. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in the chat and everything else. So let me turn off the recording for you. Oh, and just a reminder, I will be sending out the um, slides and a link, a link to the recording within two business days, so for this webinar by end of day Monday.